I never watched Never Mind the Buzzcocks on TV, simply because I was living in a country that wasn't allowed, it was illegal. So I never got to watch it. I have watched it quite a bit on YouTube, clips here and there, and it's funny, uh, until they got replaced with somebody else. What I did not realise was that Never Mind the Buzzcocks ran from 1996 to 2014. And um, with specials and what are specials? Quite a few specials. I'm guessing there's 36 specials and another dozen specials on top. So we're talking 50 specials and 28 seasons. 96 to 2004. Yeah. I had no idea I'd run this quite so long. I'm still downloading it. I've got the first series for, uh, downloaded. Mark Lamar, funny guy. Very, very cutting black humour. I love it. It's brilliant. It's one of those um, panel shows that you don't really care who wins and loses. And he got a lot of famous names on here. Not just Bill Bailey. And there's quite a few famous storms where they just storm off in a huff, get pissed off, swearing, shouting, doing drugs. This is on live TV. Most of this is completely illegal and unavailable anywhere in the world. Fortunately, I have the internet. So therefore, I can get whatever the fuck I want. This is when Right Said Fred finally came out as being gay. Because up until this point, everyone assumed they were straight. I mean, yeah, they were like butcher macho and shaved, which wasn't a very manly thing at the time back in the 90s. This is the mid 90s, by the way. So people still weren't coming out as being gay. And this is when they actually, they never said they were gay, but they pretty much implied it and made it obvious. And um, yeah, the, the, the show's great for many reasons, the humour and the guests, but it's also you get clips of classic music from the era. That was current, like um, Prefab Sprout. Yes, that is the name of a group. It, it's funny, it's good. It's also not that scripted. They get a little script, but not very much. Holy shit. Um, give an idea of how old this program is. They just, they're, they're doing a round, it's called the intros round. A lot of it's just fucking about. But there is actually a quiz there somewhere. The intros round is they got to mine a song and the other guy's got to guess it um they just did one and it was da 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 and I'm thinking I know that tune because I've got like the greatest hits of him um Gary Glitter this is back when Gary Glitter it was a rock star, a pop star, the granny's favourite, before he took his computer to a shop to get it fixed. And they found underage nudity on it. His life has been fucked ever since. Apparently like the eight-year-old. But anyhow, yeah, so they just mind one of his songs. Not one sex offender joke. My God, this is old. I think it was like 20 years back-ish, not sure when exactly that he got on the paper as being dodgy. I still don't know what he actually did. I know some women say, he fucked me when I was eight, but he was never charged. So it's just her word against his. And it sounds more like she's just trying to do it to get money. I don't know, maybe it's real, I don't know. But she was friends with his daughter, apparently. I, I'll, you only get one side of the story so you don't really know what happened. But um, yeah, so that's kind of, that could be a reason why the program is banned, but I seriously doubt it. That's be a lot more dodgier crap than one little comment, because otherwise they just re-release it with that bit deleted. Talking of which, I just downloaded all three series of bottom. I've already got the stage stuff I got, I got. Um, but I also downloaded the young ones. Now the young ones were shown on TV as 20 minute long episodes, which that's a normal length. But the, I haven't watched them yet, but the copies that I've got are between 35 and 60 minutes long. 
So all I can assume is the BBC cut a lot of it out before putting it on TV. Some of it, 40 minutes, was cut out. So that's going to be a very, very interesting thing to watch. The programme is heavily, heavily inspired by Give Us a Clue, which was a very, very daytime Housewives um, quiz show from the 1980s, 1970s kind of thing. You have people like, um, not Tony Blair, Lionel Blair. Bill Danny Boy, it'd be on there. And you have to mime something, you know, is it, a, is it a film, is it a book, how many words? This is very heavily inspired by that, but for more of an adult audience. This round is called the Decipher, um, Indecipherable Lyrics, where you've got a song and you've got no idea what they're singing, but you sing along to it anyway. And so it's a case of you've got to either try to work out what it is that are, they are actually saying, or make up your own. There's one episode I saw with the Spice Girls and they made up their own, like, you know, like, go for a bling and a bong and a drug and it, yeah. You've got to bear in mind the Spice Girls were basically all chavs. Yeah, they got through a lot of cock in your day. In this round, they had to decide what's going to happen next, but they pause it. It just had Bonnie Tyler with Total Clips at the Heart about her grooming school children. And now we've got um, a song about a man with a detachable penis from 1990. Oh, I don't know. A lot of the time, people in the industry, entertainment, know what's going on. They just don't talk about stuff because they want to keep their job. Now, this can be in sports. Schools, police, NHS, 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 and the entertainment industry. Which makes you wonder, because the first episode they had Gary Glitter, who ended up being classified as a nonce. And in this episode, you've got Michael Jackson, who is the most prolific serial child rapist of all time. Um, one of the reasons why Mark Lamar gets so much shit is because he's honest. He speaks his mind to a certain degree. And Michael Jackson didn't actually get outed as a nonce until, geez, 20 years later? It wasn't until he was kind of dead that he actually got outed as being this prol prolific serial paedophile. He was never actually convicted, but he actually admitted to it on camera that he would have fake weddings, he would watch hardcore porn, he had a bed and he would sleep with like 20 or 30 children every single night and watch hardcore porn with them. And there was lots and lots of accusations. He apparently went bankrupt paying them off. Um, so this was actually 96, can I say? This is probably 15, 20 years before he was finally outed. And the comment that Mark Lamar just came out with was when this video was shown, Michael Jackson was just a 13 year old innocent young boy and he really fancied himself back then. Brum, bum, bum. Michael Jackson just split with his girlfriend, Lisa Marie Presley, due to unreconcilable differences. He wanted to have children and she wanted to call the police. It's one of those programmes and his wit is very quick. I love it. It's brilliant. It come out this little one-liner that takes five seconds to say, do you say that? What does it mean? You have to be quick to get it or you just miss it completely. For example, he starts off by saying that Papa was a Rolling Stone and his mother was still in school. I had seriously forgotten how good this program is. About a third, between a quarter and a third of the whole program is music. And because the only way you get to watch this program anymore is on YouTube, because they don't show it on normal TV. If you watch it on YouTube, they have to delete all the musical bits, otherwise they get copyrighted. And shot at a really, really shit resolution. Whereas this is really, really good. I mean, the online version, you're talking maybe 10, 15 minutes, or they'll loop certain bits, so it seems longer than it really is. Um, full version, 28 and three quarter minutes for this episode. Some of them are about 45 minutes. It's really good. The music is amazing because it's really, really good music. It's not just new stuff like from the mid 1990s. It's stuff going back to the 80s, a lot of 80s, 70s, 60s. It's great. 
And part of the setup is that they have a group and they'll show it to the audience, they'll show it to the people at home, they won't show it to the contestants. Like um, Shwaddy Waddy, awesome group, awesome British band, Teddy Boys. And they had one of their um, songs come on where they played Top of the Pops. It would have been 20 years before this program came out, so nearly 50 years ago, and they're still popular, they're still really good. And so they, they play the clip so everyone can see it, and then they bring on the people as they are at that time, like 20 years later, to try and identify them. And it's great, it's brilliant, it's awesome. I like the program. To add an even more disturbing level of creepiness to Jonathan Ross, um, they're doing the lyrics round. This is episode, whatever the fuck episode it is. What episode is it? This is episode, series one, episode five, 18 minutes in. So you can actually check it for yourself. Um, they're on about lyrics. And somebody said, oh, it's, 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 it's not life, it's like you're praying for death. And he says, huh, that's like my marriage to my wife. Who is at this moment in time back then locked up in a mental hospital? Yeah, that's one sick fuck. I can like this series. I'm only on the first series still. I've got several decades downloading. Um, comments come out that at the time watching it, you would have been thinking, "Oh yeah, Rolf Harris, because he's doing a show about poorly animals and poor little baby animals and." Um, now we know his interests were with regard to little children and uh, the comment he just came out with oh, imagine Rolf Harris walking on and saying oh what's wrong with this little one or what we're going to do with this little thing yeah completely different bloody context now a lot of the humour is satirical Satire is humour based upon reality, observations. For example, this is 1997, Crown Series 2. Um, the height of TV, reality TV, was called Gladiators. The presenter was an absolute fucking, not a nice person, called Erika Johnson. She sticks in my head because, yeah, she was skinny, blonde, and big tits, but she also destroyed a man and his life and his family because she falsely accused him of rape. She admitted, she, she named him, and he did nothing wrong. And yet, she went on to have a successful career. His career, in children's TV, was destroyed. Everett still regards him as a rapist, even though she admitted that she lied. But um, he's just made a little joke, a dig about her, because he's on another, uh, another quiz show with her, and he hates her. He really hates her, because of what she's done. But she still works because, you know, she's blonde with tits. Uh, a joke was, oh, there was a band called Panther and a band called Snake and a band called... But I don't know anything about them, but with names like that, they probably shagged her. Because she was shagging all the gladiators and the sound crew whilst being married to somebody else. But uh, this is a TV programme that even though the jokes are satirical and they're of the age and the era and the music is obviously older than 96 because that's when it was made, it's still really funny. The, the interactions is really, really funny. And the way it's made. They've got a basic script, but it's only basic. They're funny people. They're a laugh. It's, I'm watching this, and I have a constant smile. Believe me, there are times when you need it. Um, he cannot go an episode without slagging off the Spice Girls. And I mean constantly slagging them off. Um, it'll make constant jokes about them. Every episode, at least one joke. He's now doing it. Well, we're in, it's only a half an hour fucking episode. We're 19 minutes into this episode and he's already slagging them off four times. And at some point in the future, he does actually have one of them on at least one, possibly several. I know he has Sporty Spice on in the future at some point, but he, especially Ginger, she's not, she's younger than him, I'm pretty sure she's younger than him, but because she's older than the other, all the rest are late teens, I think, late teens, maybe about 20 years old, and Sporty's about five years older, not that much older, and definitely the fucking fittest, 
she, um, there was pictures released of her posing naked, you know, photos. Really fucking fit. But um, yeah, he really does like slagging them off. Watching this is kind of good, but I just had a quick sneak peek at the most recent episode, and it's basically a highlights of the past 30 years. And they completely ignore Mark Lamar. It was actually his concept, his idea, he started it, he made it, and they completely ignore him. So, uh, yeah, bitter fucking bastards. They didn't even mention him. And uh, Phil Jupiter is still in it. He quadrupled his size. Beard to try and cover up, doesn't work. Uh, this guy isn't in it, which is not really a surprise considering he looks like he's about one pill away from dying of a heart attack from drug overdose. And he looks constantly fucked up on drugs. I mean, constantly. They've all got booze, and a lot of them are on drugs whilst they're making it. That's really obvious, and they actually say it quite a few times. But the fact that Mark Lamar, who actually made it a hit, isn't even mentioned in the last episode is kind of creepy. I, mean, I know there was like a lot of bitter stuff between them, but um, yeah, fuck it. It is really good though with the historic side of it, not just the fact that these are really fit fucking girls. Yeah, I've never seen, I mean, it looks nice, but I think the practicality, I've never seen the appeal on banging bones. I mean, I don't want a fat fucker. But that's scrawny, that's just scary. But um, yeah, it's good, it's entertaining, it's interesting. But this guy looks like he's about to drop dead from a fucking overdose. Yeah, the morality of America. This is Jerry Lee Lewis, who married his 13 year old cousin. Yeah, that's when he married her when she was 13, not when he started shagging her. And um, apparently, he tried smashing his uh, piano by getting his leg over because he thought it was under 12. Yeah, they kind of creepy, the fact that these people do this stuff and it's public knowledge and they never get arrested and their music is still played. Yeah, really creepy. I mean, Christ, it's one thing looking at a 13 year old and thinking, yeah, nice, perky, tight body. It's another thing fucking it. It's, it's like it's one but then we live in a, a world where it's perfectly acceptable in the western world to go into a art gallery and see naked children where it's perfectly acceptable to go into a garden center or a diy shop like b&q and buy a life-size statue of a naked child not just a naked child or a naked baby but a naked 12 year old with buds you couldn't make this shit up I am well aware that it is a psychological conditioned response, but just because she's wearing a bright red colour, which is a symbol of youth, red is, um, for white people, associated with youth because it's what the face looks like when they're going through puberty, you get the, red, the face is flushed. The nipples are pinker, the lips are redder, so red makes a person look younger if it's female. White also makes a person look younger because the whiter of the skin, the blonder the hair, the more innocent the person looks. It's all about psychological conditioning. But looking at this person, you wouldn't think she was in her... Well, let's put it this way. This is Toya Wilcox, who had a hit single um, in the 1970s, I think it was, early 1970s. This is a quarter of a century later. So you look at that bad, actually. And this is series three. And Mark Lamar has been slagging her off in every series. Not every episode, like the Spice Girls, but in every series. So he has been slagging her off, you know, about, about oh, well, you just give up and die sort of thing, you know, poor old cow and oh, very sort of like offensive type stuff. He's not even mentioned the fact that he said bad things about her and I'm pretty sure somebody would have told her. And she didn't do anything else other than TV presenting, like how dirty is your house, that sort of stuff. Daytime reality TV. And nobody actually heard from her for the past 25 years, up until a TV series called Stranger Things. Played one of her songs, uh, Running Up The Hill. And it got back to number one. And all of a sudden, everyone knows who she is. Although I think she rather they didn't because she's gotta be 60s, 70s, 80s now. 
Don't know. Don't really care. Good series. I'm up. To, I'm actually binging the lot at the moment. I mean, up to series three. I don't know what half seven one. There's only about half a dozen or maybe seven or eight episodes per series. Um, halfway through series three. I currently, I mean, they're only half an hour long-ish, and the video quality is not great. I think it's been recording with VHS from VH1. It was a music channel back in the 90s. And I've so far got downloaded seven series. And there's 28 in social plus specials. So, um, yeah, it's, it doesn't get boring, it, which is good because you're watching it and you've got a smile on your face nearly the whole time. Not all the time, but nearly the whole time you've got a smile. And it's one of these things they had um, Lemmy. He's some old rocker. I don't know what fucking group he's in. But he was old then. I don't know if he's still kicking now. But he's there and he's got, he's got a cigarette out, he's got a fag in his mouth, and um, not allowed to smoke on TV. I so, said, oh, okay, it's not lit, I'm just holding it. Yeah. This was back in the days when you could have a bit of anarchy without being racially or politically offensive. Just offend the individuals, not the, not the establishments. 1976, Angie Cutler and the Wurzels. This is a local West Country band. As a kid, I didn't realise all those songs were about sex. Didn't know that. I was a kid, there was no internet, there was no porn. So we didn't know, so I'm there hanging around, humming away at their number one hit single, um, Combine Harvester. And I got smacked in the head with a lump of wood by a teacher in school. It leaves like blackboard erasers was basically a big lump of wood. A bit of foam on the end, uh, cloth on the end. So you get smacked around the head. Like, what the fuck hit me for? They never told me why. They just said, don't sing it. Now, as an adult, I know why. I drove my tractor through your haystack last night. It's how the song starts. Now, if you think that a rich person, their penis extension is a Porsche or a motorbike, then a Wurzel is going to be a tractor. Now, back in the 70s, women didn't shave their genitals to look like a baby. They had a big bush, like straw, like a haystack. So when they sing, I drove my tractor through your haystack last night, yeah, uh, and this is also back in the day when the Wurzels were, I think they had one guy who was Scottish, but everyone else was English. Now, they're still going, except there's only one guy that, actually no, there's no one left who's English. They're all from other countries. So not exactly traditional, but the music is still unknown. The group is still unknown. The music is, people still know the bloody words. Just, you know, some of it is rather inappropriate, like um, the child shop or um, my Somerset crumpet horn. I put it in her tiny hands, so curly and fat. I hope she won't blow too hard. Can't treat it like that. Series 3, 1998, I think it was. Michael Jackson has still not been publicly outed as a paedophile, but everyone I actually knew about it. I mean, I didn't watch TV for 15 years because on the run, but yeah, apparently it was common knowledge because he just came out with a comment that he's really excited one day he's going to go backstage because somebody said um, Boyzone was in was in the back, and he's disappointed because he thought it was going to be a group for you know he didn't think it'd be a pop group. He thought it'd be a, a zone with boys in it for him too. Yeah. This is actually the 1982 Eurovision song entry, and yes, that is her vagina. And you thought Buck's fizz were sexy. Yeah, that's disturbing. Um, yeah, right now, the only people that can do paedophile jokes, I don't watch daytime TV or live TV at all. Or any other kind of like TV stations. I download TV series and movies. Occasionally I watch the news. But um, so, know, so far as I'm aware, the only people that do paedophile jokes and sex offender jokes is Ryan Reynolds and Jimmy Carr. Back in the 90s, apparently it was more common to make sex offender and child sex jokes. Grandma, 
for those who are not aware of the slang term, snatch is a slang term for vagina. Lots of little snatches. Um, he's given up his subtlety with regard to slagging off certain people, like um, Ginger Spice, yeah, she auctioned off her Union Jack dress of £40,000 that has been used you know, for Queen Victoria's coronation. And his jokes about Michael Jackson are no longer jokes, it's just, yep, his new follow-up album is going to be called Fucking Up Back With Children. And this is a group that sang a song, Manny. I don't want jewels, I don't want things, just give me money. An honest song for a change. Oh, the 80s, how I miss thee. He's been making a lot of references about Chris Evans. Um, you gotta bear in mind, I have a personal dislike of these people. Not Mark Lamar, I think he's actually quite honest and straight. Yeah, I like him, he's right. Um, but you've got people like Jonathan Ross and Chris Evans, they're both nonces. They both groomed schoolgirls and married them. As if that's going to legitimise them fucking these schoolgirls. And um, yeah, Chris Evans brags about it. I got to fuck a teenager. Yeah, you're in your 40s. It's one thing to fantasize about fucking a teenager, it's another thing to go and groom a child. Uh, so Ethan's slagging off Chris Evans, not about the fact that he married a schoolgirl, but, you know, basically calling out a ginger twat and stuff like that. So obviously he's complained about it. And uh, another Radio 1 presenter, DJ, was on the first episode of the fourth series, which it, this is. And um, apparently he complained afterwards about his treatment being called fat. Mark Lamar doesn't discriminate against types, he discriminates against every fucker. And he doesn't give a shit who it is, he'll slag them off. That's his thing. And he just slagged them off even more during the last episode, episode 3 from series 4. And the last thing he said was, you know, ginger twatty bollocks, fat, you know, ugly fucker. Um, sorry, Chris Evans. Yeah, it's... He's riding high at the moment. He's, this is probably 98 or 99. It's about 1998, 1999. Spice Girls were on top of the world for fuck's sake. And so was this guy. He was about 30 years old, maybe 31. In his peak, in his prime, top of the game. And uh, he stayed there for a few more years. He kept presenting this program for, I think, I've not watched them all, I've only seen a few. Well, okay, I've now seen three and a half series, but it's only the past week I've actually been watching them. I've only seen the occasional clip. And they're brilliant, they really are. Um, from the little read up I did, he did 17 years on this program. I thought he only did a year or two and then got kicked off. Turns out he did quite a bit. Um, yeah, this is actually a pop video. I think the reason things are so obvious is because she's underwater. Hold your breath, girl. Hold your breath. I'm kind of glad that it's a fuzzy quality episode. Some of the episodes are pretty good quality, some are quite fuzzy. Um, this would appear to be the um, very thin white top episode. This is the fourth girl they've had on, and we're only two minutes into the program. Bloody cold. Yes, it's a 1999 version of Russell Brand. Or some of the brand. They all look the same. Season 4, and I am deeply confused. Yeah, as a guy, girls as well notice this. They notice like VPLs and stuff, visible panty line. It's just some people more subtle. Um, what the fuck is she wearing? It's only a quick flash, but what the fuck is she wearing? This is season four, the Christmas special. Um, they did 27-ish seasons, series. But you got to bear in mind, not always, but a lot of them, 
they are two series per year because it sounds better and they make more money. Back in the olden days, you would have something like, um, about the same time as this, 1998, you would have something like Babylon 5 would do 24 episodes per series, whereas they're doing seven. Um, the, the quality on series five, the recording is really bad. It's so bad it won't actually play on the TV. Fortunately, I've got a computer. He's still slagging off Chris Evans. Or rather, somebody else did. Uh, he's a guy in his 50s at this stage, still shagging teenagers. Anywho, um, I think you all work for the same company, the BBC. But he's on about um, this rocker from the 60s and 70s called Lenny, who's frontman for some really famous rock group. I don't know which one. I, I like music. I don't go for music musicians, I'm not a fanboy. I love music, I love meatloaf and stuff, but, and like uh, Imagine Dragons, but I wouldn't recognize the bloody people. I wouldn't know the names of the people in the group, other than meatloaf. Um, but it, this guy called Lenny was on, and he's just saying that, you know, oh, and on other news, Lemmy was on a show called Never Mind the Buzzcocks, their show, last season, and he stormed off and he said, this will be unbroadcastable because I'm storming off, which didn't work because he stormed off after they finished this recording, is not like before. Mind-blowing. On one team, blah, 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 Billy Piper, before she was an actress, when she was still a singer. And uh, she's the one who was basically still in school when she married Chris Evans. Um, and the other team, Meatloaf, he died this year, I think. This would have been about 20 years ago, oh, over 20 years ago. And he is like rock fucking god legend. The fact that he's actually on a game show is unheard of. It's a shame that this whole series has been blacklisted. Well, at least the episodes with Mark Lamar in, that he presents, all this sort of shit is basically banned. I absolutely love learning new things. Always have done, always will do. I'm the sort of guy who would take something apart just to see what makes it work. So I can prove it. And this is the case of, I've heard this song for decades. It's done by a group called Snow. And the lyrics are, I swear I'm playing without it getting copyrighted. <laughs> I never knew it was a white guy. I don't mean like, it's, that's just kind of mind blowing. It's a white guy. That song has a whole new meaning. I don't look in your bum bum now. Also has a whole new meaning in the modern era. I don't see that. I've never seen the attraction in looking at someone's asshole. An ex try getting me to do it with her. Like, Fuck off. I'm going to go on the front of you because you can find toilet paper out there. I think this is 1998. Series 5, I think it is. Uh, 1998. Um, she was born in 82. So that makes her. Um, kind of gel bait? I think. My arithmetic's kind of screwed up. 82, 92 is 10. Yeah, she's about 17, so she's not quite job eight. The thing is, she's 17, but she's already with Chris Evans. And pretty soon she's going to get married to him. And spend the next three years in a constant drugs stupor. Because that is basically what she spent the three years of her marriage with him doing, is sucking a fucking and... Yeah, it's a really good job she's on contraception, otherwise you would have no idea who the parents were. Because a lot of people went through that. A lot of money was spent keeping the pictures out of the media. You gotta feel a bit sorry for the kid. She was a kid back then, I mean, she was technically still in school. Um, she's been thrust into the limelight as a singer in a group. Don't ask me what the group's called, I have not got a clue and I have not got the interest in Googling to find out. She had a solo career. She's still like 17 or something, and they're asking her about bands that were 
20 years before she was born. They're playing music. Can you guess the tune? <laughs> is it a theme tune to Black Beauty? Um, is it from the advert for... She hasn't got a fucking clue. It's not just the fact that she's very, very young. She's a teenager. It's also the fact that she has no interest in anything other than reading lines on a script to music. She doesn't actually act or sing. She just reads the words to a song and wiggles around. That is it. That's what she's ever done. She's gotten by for her entire life on her looks and her tits. And she's being asked questions and she doesn't know any answers. And it's not just because she's not old enough to know it. She just doesn't have any interest in anything other than herself. And she looks so lost and alone. And they're giving her points just because she's pretty. They're actually saying that. You know, yeah, meet love, you got the answer right, but I'm giving the points to her because that's how the world works. Yeah, I, I don't think she changed much over the years. I never knew who the fuck she was until she was in Doctor Who, which would be two or three years after this, when she was about 18, 19. So yeah, she'd be about 15, 16 in this. Um, she came across as a brain dead slapper in Doctor Who. There wasn't any acting involved, as I found out after doing a bit of research. This is someone who has never, I'm not harping about it too much. Meat looks hilarious in it. He hasn't got a clue what's going on and he don't care. It's taken him 50, 17 minutes into the show, which is like halfway, to realize it's not a real game show. The real objective is just to have a laugh. So now he's getting into it. Before he was trying to take it seriously for a proper game show. Anyhow, um, Billy Piper, she is so used to getting her, home, her own way. No one's ever said no to. You can tell by looking at the, girl, the woman, girl, child, whatever, that she's never had no said to her. And she's trying to do the intros. They are actually doing the intro, you know. Do, 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 do. And, but because the girl doesn't get the answer straight away, She's turning these cards so he can read the answer. And then she actually puts it on the desk facing him so he can read the answer. Yeah, she's one of these people that the rules don't apply to her because she's young and she's pretty. And when that wore off in the early noughties, she went to get her tits out publicly, as opposed to all the sex tapes that are still on Pornhub from when she was a teenager. Yeah, she was ridden. But yeah, back to the episode. Right, Lamar, 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 I just made up the scores he went along to Billy Piper's team one. And he finished it by saying, if love and you's wrong, then I, I don't want to go to prison. And and yet, two years later, she was married to a guy in his 40s. Is it mid 40s or late 40s, Chris Evans? And he was born in the 60s, so it was like a few decades difference. It's a comic relief special. Comic relief started off in the 1990s. It's actually a massive con job by the BBC to actually scam tens of millions of pounds out of people to go to their own pockets. But they made characters going to charities because they're separate companies. It's a big con job scam that only came to light in the past year or two. This guy I fucking hate. His name is Lenny Henry. He did... Um, he, he worked with some comics as like a side character back in the 1980s, a decade before this. And he had one sitcom of his own, and that was it, just the one. I don't even remember what it was called. He played some pirate radio DJ, the British, the Brixton Broadcasting Corporation or something. That's all I remember, and that's all I remember him doing. But that's what he's ever done. He's only ever been famous for being married to a short, fat, white woman called Dawn French. And as soon as he was no longer married to her, it was a really abusive marriage on his part, um, he hates white people. And he's always hated white people. And he came out with a comment over the past two years that we don't need any white saviors. Really? Who the fuck pays your wages? Who the fuck pays the welfare payments, the NHS? Who pays for all that? 
It's not black people paying taxes. He sure as fuck hasn't. He had, he's barely paid any tax in his entire life. This all gone into offshore accounts. The majority of the tax paid to the British Exchequer is from white people. Next is Chinese people. Next is Asian people. Black people don't even come in the top thousand fucking. So no, you don't want white money? Fine. What the fuck are you going to do to pay your rent? To pay for your utilities? To pay for defence of the country? To pay for the police? Lives in a fucking fantasy world, this guy. The only money he's ever legitimately earned for himself is doing adverts for some budget bed and breakfast. I don't know who this person is. Mark Lamar is not in it. Uh, the only recognisable people are Phil Jupiter's playing one of the team captains and um, Meatloaf. That's it. Nobody else. I used to think, because I've never really watched it, that Comic Relief was a child orientated charity event. So it was, you know, anyone can watch it. They did adverts for kids to join in and I have seen a clip of Ron Atkinson playing Doctor Who or The Master or something and the Doctor regenerates into somebody with garlic tits. Um, anyhow, it was always, I thought, child related, child orientated. I, the joke he just come out with, um, a joke about anal rape. I don't know who this person is, Angus Deaton possibly? For some reason that name comes to mind, I don't know. But that's just disturbing and creepy. Yeah, there is obviously something quite vicious going on in the background. Uh, I don't know the name of the person who's actually presenting it. Angus Deaton comes to mind, but I, I don't know. But for some reason, there is a nasty fucking undertone here. Because he slagged off Meatloaf about him doing a drunken ramble rage when he accepted an, an award. A comedy award or something, which Meatloaf is now pissed off about, and has you know said, "Oh well, I'm just going to be an incoherent rambling, am I?" He's doing it with a smile, but he's obviously fucked off. Phil, I think it's Phil Jupiter. I don't know if his surname is Jupiter or not. For some reason, it's in my head. Phil, where the fuck his name is? He's pissed off because the other guy was slagging him off for his weight, basically calling him a fat fucker. So um, yeah, he's basically slagging them both off, and it's live on TV. So they can't really go over and punch him in the face. Okay, meet up good. Okay, it's got nothing to do with no, never mind about Cox, other than it's got Meatloaf, who was on one episode, and Phil, whatever the fuck his name is, who's one of the captains. Um, it is Angus Deaton, who's being a cunt. Now, this part of the challenge is, can you identify the famous person by touching them? And who have they got? Soft porn queen, Samantha Fox, for fuck's sake. Who at this point is going to be mid-30s, I think. She's the one who was jailbait in the Sun newspaper. They did a countdown of her getting her tits out on page three when she was 16. Which means they groomed her from the age of 14. And they had her in sexy outfits, lingerie, bra half off, um, half minge out school uniform, only just covering her nipples, as a countdown up to her 16th birthday. So we're doing that, soft porn shoots, when she was 14 or 15 years old. And yet the son has never been prosecuted for historical sex offences. Anyhow, this is the episode they got to grope her. They see whether or not they can see who it is, for fuck's sake. This is just creepy, creepy fucking programming. I, I'm tempted to just skip it. I mean, the entire episode is only 14 minutes long. So I'm just going to fast forward through it and go on to the next episode of the actual Nevermind of Us Cox. And continuing the bimbo theme, they have had women on here. Not a lot of women want to go on there, but the ones they have had were actually, you know, normal people. They have a brain, they can speak, they can think, they can rationalise. The last one was Billy Piper, a complete bimbo airhead. Also a jailbait. But this one, um, Kate Thornton, I think her name is. I think. Yeah, Kate Thornton. 
She doesn't have the age as an excuse to be sick as shit. She's, this is 1999, so she would have been 27. And she's made her career ever since as um, a bimba, a TV and radio presenter. I did a quick look on her bio. Basically, they have her to do the first episode of something. And then they get rid of her because she's sick as shit. And she has no opinion. She has no, nothing. She has to be fed everything. So they have her to present the first episode of something. And there's quite a few programs they've done this with. A lot of Channel 4 stuff, which is not surprising. They're the dodgiest channel out there. Um, yeah, she's a complete airhead. She's got a clue about anything. She's a lot like Billy Piper, but older. And she wants um, people to give her the information and give her the points just because she's pretty. She's not that pretty. Uh, she was the first pres female presenter on X Factor. She didn't last very long because nobody liked her and she had no character, personality or opinion. The thing is, I don't believe these people are like that in real, in real life, but they just project that because that's what they think they have to do to progress in life rather than actually trying to better themselves. As I've said, the series generally have two series per year. The first series of 1999, which was series five, I gave up. The sound quality was so bad, it was giving me a migraine for fuck's sake. And um, don't really want to go hide in the cold room. So series six, the first joke is, um, Mama just killed a man. Well, Serve your fucking right for breaking his mother's relent. Mama just killed a man. Well, serve your fucking right for breaking into my remote farmhouse. This is a direct satirical joke. Could be considered poor taste if you don't own a house. I do, but not in this country. But if someone broke into my house, I'd fucking kill him. It's that simple. Now, the, the satire with this is that 1999. A farmer had just been locked up for killing a burglar who broke into his house. Two, I think they were teenagers, broke into his house, assaulted him, and tried to rob him. He shot one with a shot. Yeah, he, if he had just shot them, he might have gotten away. Got away with it. But he didn't. He chased them out of the farm and blew one away with a shotgun. And the other one tried suing him for trauma. And he got locked up because he actually chased the guy and shot him. But he got a lot of sympathy from the people in general. He did a few years in prison. And he got out early. But he was under... He was, he was actually second off as a VP. A VP is a vulnerable prisoner. You get two main types of prisoners. You get your main prisoners, which is your burglars, your standard people, your armed robbers or whatever. I was down as a main prisoner when I was in because I was down for a robbery. He got sectioned off with the VPs because, yeah, he, he could go with the main prisoners as um, someone who's got done for manslaughter. But because he killed a burglar and the majority of people in prison are addicts and the majority of them are burglars. I've never known a burglar or a mugger who wasn't an addict. That's why else would you do it unless you're an addict? Anyhow. He had to be sectioned off because he was under great threat of being killed by all the burglars. Okay, another bimbo. They're, they're making up a bullshit story. Uh, the, the Mafia put a severed horse in the Osman's father's head bed and he thought it was his wife to have sex with it. And then she says, What? He didn't notice it was his severed head and he still had sex with it anyway? Yeah. The, this is a TV presenter's of the 1990s and radio presenters, dear God, they must, the back of their throats must be so sore. You can't think of how else they got the jobs. 1999, Jimmy Savile was still the golden guy. I like guys and guys, 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 guys. And everyone still loved him in the public image, but yet all the entertainment industry knew he was a paedophile rapist. He worked in prisons and mental health hospitals because he knew he could rape people and get away with it. It wasn't until 
20 years after this program, or at least, what, well, it was after he died, all this came out, which would have been at least a dozen years after this program. And yet he's saying jokes about him being a child master. And yet no one ever copped on. He's basically saying what everyone in the industry knew was that he was a sex offender. This is why these programs are banned. Because it actually shows that everyone knew what he was like in the industry. But he got away with it. Till he died. This is a woman who bragged about the reason why she's so much better than all the other women, the models, is because her body and her tits are natural. Yeah. Natural tits are only worth bragging about if they're in the right place. If they're saggy, empty bags of skin like a punch of gondom, don't brag about them. He's doing a little celebration every time he tells a joke about someone. His jokes are not exactly... Okay, they're not as offensive as Jimmy Carr or Ryan Reynolds because those are two people obsessed with raping children and anal rape jokes. All Ryan Reynolds movies, he has to make as many rape jokes about people who are fucked in the ass and movies about children being kidnapped and raped. He's pretty much like the Will Smith does with his, you know, anti-white stuff. Whereas Mark Lamar's jokes are things like... Um, Oh yeah, Kurt Cobain had a bit of a shock when he was trying to remove spinach from his teeth with a shotgun. Kurt Cobain committed suicide. Kurt Cobain was a notorious paedophile drug addict lost alive. Uh, one of his most famous songs uh, is, is actually about raping school children. He made the video for it in a school surrounded by children. And yet people still love the guy and love his music. He actually wrote, I don't know if he did the artwork for it, but you won't find it in the shops, but you will find it in prison. A cartoon book, a comic book, a graphic novel, however you want to phrase it. He actually wrote this bloody thing, and it's all about raping babies, raping children, and slicing yourself open, and cutting people up so you can rape them. That's the Kurt Cobain in reality, as opposed to what the fluffy fucking midwives and middle-aged women seem to remember. The start of the episode, the blonde on the left, I've got no idea who she is. What? She plays um, the keyboard synthesizer in a band, I think. Miss Electric or something she's called. Anywho, um, start of it is a very clear shot of her tit. Doesn't wear a bra. Big firm tits. How she is now, however, that must have been um, a little bit in the past. Heavy tits go south really fast if they're not supported. Her is looking pretty empty. And yet, both the women on this, who are obviously the blonde, not so much, but the brunette is pissed out of her fucking head. I thought she was on drugs, but she's definitely fucking drunk. They've all got booze and pills under the counter. Now and again, you'd actually bring them up and you see them. But yeah, for some reason, they picked two women who are both browless. Kind of weird. Freddy and the Dreamers, and their dance is hopping from one foot to the other. Holy crap. I've no idea who these people are. Okay, one of the guys is David Essex. This woman, I've no idea who she is. I'm guessing she's a presenter. They normally have presenters on here. It's a real low budget program and they hate Mark Lamar, but he's on a contract. So it's generally BBC people and mates he's got in showbiz who actually go on the program. This is the moment this young lady went, yay, and then realised that her top has popped open and her tip popped out. Being live TV, it didn't get deleted. Being YouTube, I can't show you. Insto popto, it goes back in. That was quite funny. It's like, shit, minimal. You're wearing a skin tight outfit. Yeah, she's wearing an oriental outfit and she's Caucasian. That wouldn't be allowed today. And she was black. As a Caucasian, she's not allowed. David Essex. And the thing is, Martin Lamar is taking the piss out of him being so old. This is in 1999, 23 years ago. The guy, either this year, or last year, 23 years later, 
in his 80s, 90s, or 150, or whatever he is, he had number one hits 50 years ago. So he'd have been in his 20s or 30s. So he's got to be 70s or 80s-ish, at least, 70s or 80s. Yeah, last year or this year, he was photographed pushing around a pram. It wasn't his great-great-grandchildren. It was one of his kids. Yep, he's still knocking them out. And knocking them up. The ongoing comments, which, when it comes to some things, I was really naive up until I hit my mid late twenties, thirties, whatever. Um, especially regarded drugs. I never did drugs. I, my experience with drugs was pretty much just secondhand smoke. Never did it consciously until I was about thirty, and I bought some weed and smoked it with a girlfriend twice. And then it went mouldy because I never bothered again. And the only time I've done drugs since wasn't through choice. It was when I was locked in a room in prison. And you got no fucking choice because you can't get out. Um, but this guy, but that was like Class C drugs, like cannabis. This guy, they're constantly on about, he's gone cooking, I'm cooking. You know, I'm cooking. And he's actually got drugs under the desk that he keeps taking. I'm not talking weed. I'm talking Class A drugs. And they're all been taking them. Okay, they keep saying, how are you doing? Oh, I'm cooking, I'm cooking. And that's what I'm going to comment. Cooking is doing class A drugs. <laughs> yeah, really, really fucked up. The fact they're actually doing class A drugs on live TV, on the BBC. See, the channel up there is VHI or VH1. I can't remember which one it is now. Um, they picked up the series because BBC tried to axe it. So they got it second hand because BBC would only show it after hours and then they just basically axed the whole thing. Um, where the fuck do they get these people? They show a clip of, a, of an old group from the 50s, 60s, 70s or whatever. Sometimes it's a famous group you've heard of. They had a guy who sang, um, War! What is it? Goof! That's the only thing a guy ever did. And they drag him out of retirement. And they put in the lineup with like four other guys. And can you guess who it is? Like watching the video. This is from a group from 1982. And no idea what the group is. Didn't recognize it. Don't care. But this is now 1999. So this is 17 years ago. One of these guys was in a pop group. And I mean, you look at them and you think, could be an actor. Actor, actor, tramp that picked up off the street. Because he looks scrawny as fuck. He doesn't look as if he's had a wash and gone as that long. And he does look like somebody, homeless guy, then just went outside and picked up. You want to be on telly? Here's a fiver. Or a meal. No, he take the he take the cash. He wouldn't take a meal. Yeah, it is a little bit really, really low budget. It's funny. But really low budget. Holy fucking shit. This is a guy who died this year. Sean Locke. 23 years ago. I'd never heard of him. Till now. It's only from watching clips on YouTube of um, 8 out of 10 cats. I actually know who he is. Other than that, pff, not a clue. Best joke of his ever was um, 8 out of 10 cats do countdown and oh the bimbo what's her name Richard Riley is putting on the Viking gear to go skiing so like the snooty and stuff so nobody can recognise her face is completely covered and his combat was that's a challenging wank no on the right no idea who he is he was in a group that I'd never heard of and a song I've never heard of um, the girl in the end, she used to work in B&Q and now she presents Top of the Pops. That's pretty much all she's done. And they're both really fucking vacant expressions. You got Sean Locke doing his, he, what is his trademark sarcasm humour? Oh, he's coming out of Brit House down, do this, do this, do this, do this. And they're both sat there with like these stupid fucking expressions on their faces like, why is he talking? 
Isn't this a game show? Is that meant to be funny? And they just sat there with these stupid, empty expressions. Um, yeah, this program, the first three series was brilliant. But now you can see they've got pressure to perform. They've also got pressure to have tits on there. You actually had an entire series with only one woman, one pair of tits, and it was Joe fucking Brand. Was it Joe? Not Joe Brand. Um, oh, bollocks. The one who played the, the non-lesbian. The one who played Perry in Kevin and Perry. Shit. What the hell's her name? She came out with some really good, nasty, sarcastic humour in a sitcom called Gimme, Gimme, Gimme. Really funny. Um, that's only a pair of tits in one series. Whereas now they've got to have bimbos in every episode. And we're not talking intellectually challenged people. We're just talking complete fucking airheads. And they're just completely vacant. They don't get the idea. It's a comedy panel show. They haven't really been around that much, the comedy panel shows. Just daytime TV. So to actually have a comedy a comedy panel show with swearing in it doesn't happen. So they just look really confused. I mean, it's still a good programme, but you can see they're aiming to get tits and pretty people on board rather than people that are actually interesting. Tits on the other team is fucking brilliant. Her name is Marianne Faithful. Uh, she had a one-hit wonder in the 60s, so about 30 years before this, when she would have been like 20 or something, or 30. Whatever, she's more famous for shagging um, some guy that was in the Rolling Stones. I think it was Mick Jagger, or I don't know, someone like that. And she's funny as fuck. She's so, I don't give a shit. I did this, I did that, I did that. I don't care. And somebody's talking about gaffer tape. You know, sellotape. And she muttered, oh, those were the days. And they thought, what? A gaffer tape, those were the days. <laughs> it's just so funny. I love the girl, the woman. She's got to be 70s or 80s or whatever age she is. Marry our faithful. Um, she says, I don't really understand what's going on, but it's fun. I'm dying for a cigarette. And she's actually smoking under the table, thinking nobody's going to notice. It's just, I mind you, the last episode, the guy was actually doing drugs. He was actually cooking up heroin under the table. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, fags not that big of a deal. I miss smoking. <laughs> Took me 40 odd years to quit. This person, I would not recognize if I met her, knew her, if somebody took me a name, I wouldn't know who she was. However, the song, Oh my God, my nipples hardened, my balls tightened, it is one of these songs that just makes me happy, happy, happy. Um, She's part of a group, was part of a group. The group was only around for one album. They got together, I think it was 97, and they broke up in 2000. They had one album, and that was it. Um, this is called, it was called Hepburn. And the song that really sticks in my head, I heard it because it played on one of my favourite TV series called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And the song is I Quit. Um, I quit. I quit, loving you as a job, don't want anymore. Situate that it's, I'm not, I, if I can sing, I'm not going to sing that song because it's really, really good and youthful and energetic. And 20 years ago, I could have done it justice. Now, no. But yeah, it's really, really brilliant song. Do a search, Hepburn, I Quit. It's a really good song. It'll be all over YouTube. But it's a shame that she's got a really distinctive voice. And I thought she was American and she's actually English. It's actually a British group. They did one album and they disappeared. It's a shame because she's a fucking gorgeous babe. She's funny. She's actually got a brain. And she's got a beautiful voice. And she came up. Massive. Got a baps out and then disappeared. Which was a real shame because she's fucking gorgeous. But um, yeah, it's a really good singer. It's a shame, really. But Buffy the Vampire Slayer had one of the best series soundtracks ever. 
there's only two TV series that stick in my head as having awesome soundtracks. Three TV series that stick in my head as having awesome soundtracks. Um, first one, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The first two or three years, not the musical, that's good for a different reason, but the actual backing soundtracks was brilliant on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Smallville had one or two good songs. That was it. Supernatural had a few songs that were quite good. That was it. Peacemaker. Oh my fucking lord. Peacemaker had two or three songs that were shit. The other 30 odd were brilliant. I play that friggin' album every two or three days because the music is that good. Hair rock can't beat it. I know she's an English actress. I don't know why I know, but I do know. But the name, Martina McClutchinson, always makes me think she's Australian. And she's in a video, but I don't know if she's a singer or whatever. I know she's been on telly. I've never seen her in anything, but I've heard the name. And she's not looking that bad in her 40s. So, um, yeah. Better than my fucking ex did in her teens. But for some reason, she's... I don't know if she's a pop singer. Or just an actress. Or... I have no idea. But it's got one of those faces and one of those names that you instantly think Australian soap, soap actress turned pop star. Like so many others. Kylie Minogue, Jason Donovan, Carl McLaughlin, Natalie Imbruglia. Oh my God, I know their names. Shoot me. It took me a second to notice. This is series seven. The year 2000. And he's had a haircut, as opposed to his greasy quiff, which he has had throughout the whole previous six series. It was distinctive. It was actually quite cool. Very greasy, but cool. And he's, he's got a fucking brush cut. This group is called the Flying Pickets. It's weird. I was a toddler when they had a hit, but it got re-released 10 years later in the 80s. I was still got to number five, I think. Definitely a top ten. Um, two of them, I actually sing on the bike just for the sheer hell of it. I can scre love screaming to them. These are like, I think it's a four or five piece harmony. And um, the most famous one they had is called Only You. It's Looking from a window above, it's like the story of love. And I need you. Really, really nice shivery tunes. It's the vocals. They don't need music, just a little beat in the background, and it's brilliant. I can tell you, the two girls on the right-hand side are an American duo, Daphne and Cruz? I think they just said they were called, never heard of them, but did a quick look, and the blonde, I think, is 16. One's 16, one's 18. Uh, they're trying to laugh along to the jokes, we're only about two minutes in, and it's really fucking cringy. Uh, Phil Jupiter's in the middle is being really fucking paedophile mentality. I see, in America, they'd both be underage for, because of where they live. One of them, for several years, is still underage. And yet he's on about oral sex and licking them off and getting them drunk and licking pussy. And, and we're only three minutes into the episode. I dread to fucking think what sort of pedophile shit he's going to come out with next. Yeah, I thought it was just being really fucking pervy. I've got wood. I've got wood. Saying you've got wood is meaning you have an erection next to two school kids. Yeah. Creepy fucking nonce. Martin and Mara's attitude is really funny because the two girls are going off on a fucking... Yeah, oh, but he's doing this, but Kirk David does it. He's always doing it. And they're talking like you expect two female teenagers to talk like. Continuously. So Martin and Mara just like kicks back. Okay, I'll just sit here and listen. And um, it's funny. But I did a quick search online. And um, there's a picture of them wearing a t-shirt and it's brilliant. I can't read what the blondes says, but um, the brunette, who the fuck is Eminem? Because <laughs> that's that is funny. Because you've got to bear in mind, a lot of people back then wouldn't have a clue who he is or wouldn't give a shit who he is. It's only people 
year 2000, the only people who actually know who Eminem is are people that are over a certain age trying to be under a certain age. Um, my girlfriend at the time was about 30. And she kept listening to Eminem because she, I can really relate to this. Like, all oh, the kids, you're fucking 30, not 13. Uh, a few of the Eminem songs I liked, but most of it is just fucking jailbait, clickbait, shitbait. It's just shock therapy to get people's attention, not because it actually means anything. Um, yeah, they're cute. They're funny. They, they look, you know, like a laugh. But then the kids... And uh, there's a reunion picture. There we go. Taking into consideration, yeah, they were teenagers, but this is 20 years ago, 22 years ago. So that means that one of them is now 40, the other one is 38. Now well, they've aged all right. Better than me. Unlike some of the um, kiddie stars, like, oh, that was it. Cleopatra? Is it called Cleopatra? I think it was called, there was a girl called Cleopatra. What fucking name is that given to a kid? And she aged really badly. Super lovers, love is the message. Yeah, you see, this is one of those pervy things. See, all clothing is designed to be sexual. If it's clothing designed for kids, it's designed to be even more sexual. For example, they'll put things on their sexual places to emphasize it, to encourage people to touch it. For example, a school uniform on a, on a girl, the pockets are angled in a certain way, so the fingers go towards the clitoris. On a, a boy's school uniform, the pockets are aimed to go down lower towards the balls. The top pockets are designed, so when your hand goes in the pocket, you're touching your nipples. This is how school uniforms are designed. They're also tailored, which is really fucked up. Tailored means it shapes, it fits your body shape. It emphasizes your hips and tits. Their tops, the slogan is written where their tits are meant to be. So, um, yeah, it's kind of creepy. But yeah, four minutes in, it's a laugh. It's exhausting because they're teenagers and they're hyper and probably on drugs. Phil Jupiter is about, I think, about six foot, I think. The girls are kind of average height for girls from the 1980s, which is about five foot one. I think they're about five foot. So they are kind of dinky. And um, yeah, he, he keeps calling things like little pet. He gives them pet names, which is kind of creepy. You don't give a pet name to somebody unless you're involved with them. As in they're your relatives, your kids, your lovers or whatever. You don't give pet names to strangers or somebody else's children. That's just creepy. So they've got nice tits on. I mean, yeah, they, they're very energetic people. <laughs> I don't know if it's just the way they are, but considering they are pop stars, they've had hits, apparently. I've never heard of them. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it could be a put on. It could be a natural thing. I don't know. But I can't imagine two girls from Brooklyn would be this effeminate. Every time somebody gives an answer to a question, they, you can hear this noise. Oh, oh. It makes your nuts tighten. And they're doing all these little sexy oh, noises whenever someone speaks. It's the mannerisms and postures and everything. It's just a real shame that Blondie couldn't wear a bra that fits. She needs a bit more support. But they're adorable. It's on. It's an act. It's obviously an act. It really is. But they've got TV screens in the front of the desk. They've got a budget. Um, oh, no, they haven't. They've taken the TV screens from upstairs and put them down there. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, they're adorable. They're cute. They're funny. They're acting. But, um, yeah, it's all right. It's funny. This episode seems to be going on for a really long time. It's usual length, 28 minutes, 29 minutes, shorter than some. It's one of these programs where they can go on as long as they want, really. Anywhere between 20 and 45 minutes. 
But I think because they've got the girls on there and they go on and on and on and on and on and on. And on. They're, they're teenage girls and they really rabbit. it. It's like having a single teenage girl on, which they've had before, like with um, Billy Piper. She basically just barely spoke. Whereas these two, because there's two girls together and they're friends, they vibe off each other and they're constantly, oh yeah, oh this, oh that, oh that. Oh my God, it's exhausting. Fun, but exhausting. I'm just glad they're on telly and not in the area. They're the sort of people that, I used to have a house with girls outside the house at one point. And it's the reason I got bricks around my Wi-Fi hub. Because I used to have girls about 15 feet to the road. They would congregate there to download music and go on fucking whatever it is teenage girls do online. Don't want to know. Now, the reason I blocked my Wi-Fi with bricks is not because I'm a tight fisted git. I am a tight fisted git. It's because I don't want the neighbours to see that a single white middle-aged man has job congregating outside his front gate. Now, in my dreams, that might be a nice thing, but in reality, no, I fucking don't want that. Bradley Walsh. Unrecognisable compared to as he is now. I think he was on Doctor Who. I've not watched Doctor Who since um, they had that fucking political thing, that, that Scottish guy. Carabody? Capody? I didn't watch it. I, I gave up when he was on it. Um, I think this, I think Brad Walsh did it. I think he's a game show host now. Completely unrecognisable. Fuck it now. Bradley Walsh. A bit different to Joe B. My God, Mel B is an absolute irritating fucking creep. It's just, she's there. She's so aggressive and abusive. And she's not giving it without working for it. She, she wants to give it for free. And if you say that she's wrong, she starts, oh, I'm going to get you battered. I'm going to have you attacked. I'm going to get people to kill you. I'm going to get people to beat your head in. Yeah, th this is someone who is obviously from a council estate, so social housing, and believes her own fucking press that she's Scary Spice. Yeah, the thing about these sort of people who go around thinking they're from a nasty area, they know gangsters, they know this... Right. The fact that she hasn't got any scars on her face and her nose has never been broken shows that she's never lived in that kind of an area. I can tell you for a fucking fact, you don't live in that sort of an area without getting your nose broken at least fucking once or having someone slash your face or chuck acid in you. Or at the very least, boiling sugar. Yeah, I don't know what she's doing now. I don't care. Let's face it, they... They may have been like the biggest pop group the world's ever seen at one point. But let's face it, they were famous and popular for, what, two years? Three years? I don't know how long they were going. I wasn't into their music. You know, yeah, they were, had perky tits and they were constantly cold. But aside from that, I had no interest. Not my thing. So they were in the charts for, what, two years? One year? I don't know. After that, all they did was pop up on panel shows. Oh no, I fucked a famous person. I got pregnant by him. Ha <laughs> ha, I trapped him. Which is what she did with William Will Smith, because Will Smith's gay. Um, Eddie Murphy or someone like that. I don't know if Posh Spice got her name because she's from a posh background or because she looks posh because she's got a pretty face. I don't know. I've never heard her speak. And the fact that this is still, this is, I think it's year 2000. I think I am checking, checking, checking. If my computer won't go so freaking slow. No, wrong folder. I do have a few folders open. Yes, it's 2000. So they're still gigging. And uh, this is Mel, fuck it, Sporty Spice. And, um, she said, oh yeah, Victoria was laughing. We couldn't start why we went upstairs and she was mime. She even mimes to the tape. Apparently they're taking the piss out of her because she mimes to the songs. Which is kind of normal for her music. But the fact that her bandmates are slagging her off in public 
as well as slagging off Ginger and all the rest of it. Basically, they all slag each other off and they all hate each other, which is the impression that you get. It's not really a surprise that they split up. And the thing is, they split up because Ginger left. Because, as it turned out, Ginger was the only one who could actually sing. The other people had hits as the Spice Girls. Some of them had hits singing with other people. Like, Sporty Fucking Spice had a hit singing with um, Canadian guy, Brian Adams. She had a hit singing with him because his name was on it, not because her name was on it. I mean, I'm not saying she can't sing, but she can't sing and carry a tune on her own to make it successful. Now she's been punching the wall for the looks of her knuckles. Um, the other ones, I don't think anyone else actually tried releasing singles. I think Posh did, but she didn't actually have any success as she gave up. Whereas Ginger did release albums and they sold. I never listened to it. I've got no idea what she sounds like. i got no interest. But she, I know that she did have a reasonably successful solo career. None of the others did. Baby Spice, the only time I ever fucking remember her is when she'd pop up on like Noah's house party and she wouldn't speak, she'd just walk in. And that's about it. And the only reason that Mel Scary Spice is famous is because she was a cunt and because she got herself knocked up by shagging some black actor to try and trap him. So, yeah, they were really famous for screwing around. I think the only one that wasn't famous for screwing around was Ginger. I mean, she wasn't that fucking old. I mean, I think she's about 30, late 20s, maybe 30 at this point, whereas the rest of them are mid-20s. But, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad. If they hadn't been such cunts to each other, they'd still be gigging now. Rather than just having, like, you know, yeah, they had quite a few hits, but that's because they were in the charts constantly. And they were only in the charts for, I don't know, two years, three years? I don't think it was any longer than that. Burn out and fade away. And hopefully get some royalties. I have no idea who Token is, but he's refusing to answer any questions because he doesn't want to be um, classified as an anorak. I'm assuming he means somebody who knows the answer to questions about music. And so he's refusing to answer any questions. Well, what a twat. And um, some really don't. There was a Danish model on a couple of episodes back, Carol something rather, and she looked pretty pretty in the episode, but looking at her now, my God, it's like she's made of plastic and somebody melted her that horrendous. And she's, she's late 40s, mid late 40s, yet she looks about 120. Yeah, you can really tell the people that spent their lives doing drugs and those who haven't. I used to like Johnny Vegas very, very briefly. Well, I mean, extremely briefly. But there's a case of, he's one of these people that you wouldn't want to be around because they're always drunk and they could go off the handle and attack you at any moment. And that, that is how he comes across as an alcoholic junkie. And when they get someone like him on the program, it's just there's no coherence whatsoever. It's not the usual anarchy where it's a laugh. It's just, oh, I'm drunk, I'm going to say what I want and beat you up. And th that's the the feel of the programme. It's just, I don't know, it's like junky TV. It's pointless. And you get everyone else moving away from him because they're afraid. And it's sad fucker. Uh, another episode I may be deleting. It destroys the whole fucking episode, really. A very sad episode. This is Lisa Rogers. She is a presenter. Um, came to my attention, I'm not sure when the program came out. I binge watched stuff from decades in the past. She did a program called Scrap Heap Challenge. It started off, it carried on actually, being just a really low budget 
program, two teams, come on, we go to the scrapyard and they got to build something. And it became very popular. And she presented it for a few years. And instantly I was like, Hurrah! perfect. I enjoyed the program, but she just like, perfect. Even when she's pregnant, perfect. And then I noticed one episode, she turns up on her chosen mode of transport. She's a biker, which is not the, so much the face or the hair or the body or the tits or the tits or the tits. She's a biker. It, it's just bikers only understand bikes. Car drivers don't. I've got no idea what she's doing now or even if she's still alive. I don't know. But at the moment in time, she was definitely a biker. You could tell the attitude. And we are 24 minutes into this episode. There's only four minutes left in the episode. And she's only just spoken. This is the first time she's actually said anything. And it was like four words. She just looks constantly lost and bored shitless. Which, if you're a biker, car drivers who ride bikes don't get it. Only people who actually get it are people that are just ride bikes and no other transport. And that when you're sitting still, your brain is still going 150 miles an hour. And it's really difficult to just try and sit and do nothing. This is why I generally have um, that on the go, that on the go, that on the go. I've got to have four things on the go at the same time, as well as mental fantasy ward in my brain. Because when I'm not on a bike, my brain is still traveling at that speed. And that's what she's got. She's sat there. And she looks like she's about to have a freak out and just run because she's bored and there's nothing to occupy her brain. And she is spending pretty much 25 minutes sat there, not speaking, not having an opinion, not saying anything or doing anything. And I felt so sorry for her. I probably have screamed before that point. Series eight. It's not just because I'm binge watching decades worth <laughs> um, 26 or 27 series worth of never mind the buzz cocks in one go that I'm getting a bit bored with it it's because it's the same jokes I don't know if it's because they're all on drugs I know that the two co-hosts are on drugs and they are constantly drinking if you cannot lay off a drink for half an hour or an hour that it takes to make a program sometimes sometimes it can take a couple of hours to make a program that's half an hour long if you can't lay off the drink for that long then you've got a serious fucking problem it's like all these daytime tv presenters uh i don't know who presents daytime tv anymore holly or whatever the fuck their names are they're all alcoholics i mean there was a scene where um what was it piss morgan took a pint took his pint out from under the desk this is 8 o'clock in the morning, and he has to have a pint of beer. How fucking sad and brain damaged are you, and how much of an addict are you, that you can't start your day without having a constant supply of alcohol and drugs? Are you that much of a fucking addict? But anyway, this program is the same old jokes. Okay, yeah, that's, he hasn't slagged off the Spice Girls for a while, but then... At 2001, they're no longer popular. They've burnt out. They had their two or three years of fame, and that was it. Um, yeah, it's. I think it's because of the drugs that they don't seem to realise, or they assume that everyone else is watching it is the same, that they're just using the same jokes. Not just the same jokes, but the same questions, the same answers, the same um, name that tune. Because what part of the act is they'll mime or mumble the first start, the first like few bars of a song, but to guess it, you know, do, 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 that sort of thing. They're doing the same ones every year. The first five, six years, it was good. And you could tell they had a bit of hunger for it and, they, and it was good. But the past two or three series, it's shit. It's tedious. I don't even know if I'm going to bother keeping it or not. They, they've got this thing where they're now a box ticking program. It's a BBC program. Even though this has been recorded from VH1. It's a box ticking program now. It's 2001. Woke was kicking off big time. And it is a box ticker. It has been since series six or seven. 
but they have to have black people on if they can find any. There's not that many around 20 years ago. They have to have young-ish or young-looking women. They've had jailbait on there. They've had um, the last episode. I don't even know who's in this episode. I'm so bored I went and did cooking. And just left it to play without bother pausing it. Um, the last episode was Lisa Rogers. She's a babe, but she's in her 30s in this programme. I think she's like 30 or early 30s. Still gorgeous. I mean, she, she is now. Christ, and she's about my age, you know, over 50. But the, the programme is really slow. I, I don't know if it's something happened in his personal life with Mark Lamar. Because I'm kind of confused he lost about where actually the got show to. went down the toilet. It I just, think it, um, it I died. Series nine. All, All the, the fun comes. seemed to come out of it. Um, the episode Alcohol I just saw. And drugs are definitely it's, involved. Um, series doing nine, it on screen. Episode six. But the actual fun element. And it kind of sums gone. up the attitude and the way the game game's played. It's not really a serious game. The contestants, a lot of them have never seen the game. They've never seen the show. They've never heard of the people on it, and they've got no clue. They just get told by their agents, they want to publicise your band, your record, your book, your whatever. Go on the show, people watch it. They know what's going on. They have some guy on just now. Um, it was either Roger Sanchez, it was either Roger Sanchez or Brian Molko or Tony something. I have no fucking idea who these people are. But he, he's just saying, oh, if you'd, have asked, if you'd have said that, you'd have just given the points anyway, wouldn't you? And Martin Lamar says, yeah, I would. I like him. And he's, he's referring to, um, I think he's the lead singer of, po not Pulp, fucking... I wasn't looking at you, I was looking at... Okay, I was looking at you. That's nice to know. Um, but some um, gay goth guy. And uh, yeah, and the, the end comment from Martin Lamar, and he always has the last word, is, and just to let anyone know, nobody's feelings were hurt during the making of this program. Oh, it's, he does actually have people that actually get really pissy and attack and storm off and get violent. It doesn't always make it onto the main program. Some of them have made it onto uh, YouTube. Next episode, episode number seven. Jenny Faulkner, Becky Hunter, Ricky Tomlinson, bleh, Danny Van Day. I've heard of Ricky Tomlinson. All I know about him is that he's some northern actor who likes to abuse people. That's all I know about him. That's, I, I wouldn't even recognise the guy if I were to see him. Although I am about to. And normally they have bimbos on here that don't age very well. Toy Wilcox, she aged pretty well. I mean, she was probably in her 30s or 40s in the programme. She's been on a few times. She aged pretty good. And, yeah, pretty good makeup. Oh, yeah. Okay, I have seen that one. I had Kermit. Kermit is a black gay guy with green hair. I have no idea what the fuck he is or who he is or what he does. Or who he does. Okay, okay, next. Yeah, he's really insulting. I mean, he can't just say that the, the, the episode is 21 years ago, and that's the reason. I mean, it is 21 years ago, but even 21 years ago, it wasn't appropriate for someone to look at a black woman on TV who's singing and say, oh, yeah, she's really regretting starring in Deep Throat. Deep Throat was a sexploitation movie about a woman who had a clitoris on the back of her throat in the 70s. That's why she had to have lots of blowjobs. And Phil's getting really uncomfortable with it. She's getting really insulted by it, and he just keeps on about fucking people and it's a sort of lad's humour you get in a men's club 60 years ago not 20 years ago but then he's from the north of England which is where you still get rape gangs going around picking up children and it's considered normal this is like the difference the north-south divide in the north it's traditional to accept that sort of behaviour it's also traditional in the north for people to have Irish origins. Think of that what you will. Modern movies, modern TV series, modern interviews would not allow this, at least of all the BBC. But this is a very, very off-field programme, and they got away with it. 
And the, what they're getting away with is self-promotion, which you normally only get to do on like a Graham Norton show or um, what's that other dodgy guy, Jonathan Ross show, where people come on and they only come on the program to sell something, to sell their new movie, to sell their book, to sell their record. They don't normally do it to sell sausages. The guy on the left, he's he was in a group called Dollar. I've heard of the group. I've never heard of the music. It was him and some woman. I think it was in the 1970s or 1980s. So they haven't been around for 20 odd years. They're scraping their barrel having him on. I mean, like a one hit wonder if they even had a hit a couple of decades ago. And so he's on the show. And the thing is, he's now got a job where he's got a couple of market stalls selling sausages and flowers. And he's advertising them. He's all about giving people vouchers so they can go and get cheap sausages from his store, market store. Um, it's not a joke. He's doing it seriously. And it's it normally have someone like him on the show in the Identity Parade, where they'll have somebody like the guy who's saying, oh, what is it good for? In, like 30 years ago. And he'll pop up, living in a council estate, whatever, stand there, not speak, so they can see if they can recognise him. And they've got this guy there who's done nothing in past 20 years music related and he's on the panel. They're really desperate. The, the other people on the panel is um, Nasty Scouse fucking pervert Tomlinson, what the fuck his name is. Um, a couple of bimbos. Really scraping the barrel for contestants. But then Martin Lamar does have a reputation for being a bit of a fucker. When it comes to talking to people. As creepy as Joe Breezer is, this one is even worse. She is just completely empty. If you're not talking to her, she sits there with this empty... That's a second. She sits there with this empty expression, just, there's nobody home. Just waiting for someone to tell her what emotion to give. And then when you speak to her, she does the whole princess die head tilt. Hello, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know the rules. It's, it's only like nine years, they've been, well, nine series they've been doing this series. And... Um, you're nearly at the end of it. It's two minutes left out of a 40-minute program. But I didn't know the rules. It, it's called the intros. It's called, like, you have to say... The, he said the first line of a song. you got to say the next line. The other team's just finished theirs, and it's now your turn. And it's actually one of her songs. And she doesn't know the next lines. And she's doing this. But I didn't know the rules. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I still have the points? Yeah, that's really, really disturbing. It's not sexually appealing. It's more a case of, I wouldn't fuck somebody with Down syndrome. I wouldn't fuck her. Actually, I would fuck somebody with Down syndrome. I mean, especially if they've got epileptic seizures. That'd be fucking awesome. Instant vibrator. Less effort. This is Miley in class before she was rich, when she was just becoming famous. And she was nice. Then she became famous and became a cunt. And now, 20 years later, she's an absolute fucking cunt. And I mean, she hates anybody with a penis. And anybody that's white. Okay, this is Series 10, Episode 1. Boy George has been on a few times. And he and Martin Lamar, they have this like ongoing battle. And it's good natured, you know. You know oh, you're a puff. No, you're a puff. I'm going to suck you off. You're going to suck me off. And, but for some reason, Boy George is being an absolute fucking bitch. I don't know if it's midlife crisis, because at this point he's 30s, 40s, whatever. And um, he's on about his Chardonnay and his coffee coffee mug. He's got fly in it. 
and he flicked at Mark Lamara. So he's starting something. I'm assuming something's been going on beforehand. And they did a little banter, but instantly Boy George is being a complete fucking bitch. The face just dropped. And it was like really, 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 really hatred. I don't want to cuddle. Oh, I want a sex. <laughs> yeah, he's he's snapped to being nasty, then trying to be nice, and then back to nasty. Really, really, really it's that sort of instant mood swing. Claudia Winkleman, that in this, she's about 30-ish. It's something about that happens 30. with people who do drugs. Um, they have this, like, where they can she's switch their moods. She's so moves, slut. She doesn't seem to realise that she's calling yeah, herself a slut. Scary. Because of the stuff she's come out with. Um, I mean, right now she's 50. But she used to brag that when her first gigs was interviewing, I think it's Red TV, or Men in Motors, one or the other, race drivers. And she used to brag about she'd go around to get an interview, she would get her tits out and show them her nipple piercings and fuck them to get an, just to get an interview. And she bragged about it as if that's just normal behaviour. If you're going to do it, fine, just don't do it if you've got children. Don't brag about it if you've got children. She's got children. And she still kept going on about it. She's really... She's a good advert for why you shouldn't do drugs. Because she looks exactly the same now as she did 30 years ago. This is not a picture of her from the 1980s. This is not a picture of her from the 1990s or the 2000s. This is a picture of her four years ago when she was in her late 40s. Yeah. No cosmetic surgery. Just a fuck ton of drugs. Huh. Um, anyhow, yeah, she's a complete and utter bimbo. I'll give you a good example. She was on a, she, what she really does now is chat shows. Uh, not chat shows, sorry, that means chatting. She wouldn't be able to. Um, comedy panel shows, like, um, I was angry with that pedo guy. Um, 8 out of 10 cats does countdown. she go on stuff like that. And I'll give you a good example. There was one she did, and they said, is this true or is she lying? Did she not know how to work her remote control, so she called a builder to come out hundreds of miles to change the batteries in it? It was true. This is how brain damaged she is. I mean, serious fucking brain damage from the drugs. She's admitted all the drugs she used to do, and apparently still does. So, it does just go to show you how far you can get in life with your tits and promiscuity. I mean, she's funny, but she's funny because you're laughing at her, not with her. So, um... Anyway, yeah, right, okay, back to, never mind, the buzzcock. Oh, and the other woman on there is Susie Cotra. Glam rock from the 60s or something. At the time, 21 years ago, she was known as Kerry McFadden. Now she's known as Kerry Katona. What the hell happened? She was slim ish. She wasn't skinny, she had a belly, but she wasn't like fat or anything. She had massive tits, pretty face, good voice. Then she married an Irish guy and spent time in the Republic of Ireland. Just have a look for Kerry Katona now. She looks like she's about 90 years old. She looks like she's a junkie, has been a junkie for a long time, to the point where, like most addicts, whether it doesn't matter if it's weed or heroin, all addicts are the same. They quite happily prostitute their own children to make money. And she has done. She actually had an OnlyFans channel when she was doing porn and she got her children involved. And she had, I don't know how old the kid was, 13 involved with the OnlyFans channel. I don't know what it was they were doing. I kind of just switched off whenever I heard about it. But yeah, that's kind of creepy. And it's like the eyes are the mirror to the soul and hers are really empty. 
This guy is called Pete Burns. Pete Burns, I think his name is. He's a complete nerd bitch. Uh, I mean, he tries to do the gay icon thing like, um, oh, Boy George from Cotch Club. But it doesn't work. He just comes off being spiteful and hate-filled. Boy George does it, and he comes across as being a diva bitch. And he has the banter with um, Mark Lamar. This guy just comes across as being an absolute nasty piece of work. Uh, he's famous for being famous. He was in a pop group in the 70s and he had one hit wonder. And that was, you spin me right round, baby, right round. That was it. One song. And he became famous for all the plastic surgery he's had and for being a cunt. That's all he's really been famous for. It, well, he's made a living out of it. But the amount of surgery he had, it's kind of melted. That's how he ended up looking with all the surgery and the implants in his face. Um, he died six years ago at age 57. You can't live your life with that much hatred. I, my life has been completely fucked so many times. And when I say completely fucked, I don't mean, oh no, I lost a, I lost a tanner. I mean, where I just start completely from scratch, on the run, with just the clothing I was wearing. And another time without any clothing I was wearing because, like, different story. But I've had to start from scratch so many times in my life with nothing. My children gone five times with different people. You can't live with that sort of hatred. It burns you up inside and it burns you out. You have to find some kind of centre. Yes, I do still spend most of my nights without getting any sleep. But then that's just insomnia. Yeah, this guy, he's just... It's really sad that he spent so much of his life bitter and angry and twisted. It was a case of he had a, a hit in 1980 something rather. Yeah, 1984. So he would have been 25 years old. So he had his one hit wonder when he was 25 and then spent the next... Um, what, 50, uh, 30, 40 years being a cunt because he wasn't famous anymore for singing? Kind of sad. It's a very pathetic, sad common thing that you get on this program on um, Buzzcocks. You might get the occasional white guy that does it. Oh, I can't admit to knowing that music. My fans would kill me. But he actually says that. But you get the black people come on, like her, I don't know what fuck her name is. June something rather. Sapangi, Sapango, Saplong. I'm not being racist. That is what her name actually is. Um, Sarapong, Sapong. Sarapong. June Sarapong. Is her name? Um, she, she refuses to actually acknowledge the existence of any music unless it's black. And they're doing a song which is a very, very common song. Not just the fact that it's a common song that I know now, 21, um, this is 2020, this is 2002, 20 years later. So the fact it was one of the biggest hits of the previous two years. It's um, Disco 2000 by Pulp. It was played everywhere for several years. It's still played now. And she's got, oh, is it Xanadu? Yeah, that this sort of, the only, music, the only music that exists is black, makes me want to hurl. It, it's just so fucking offensive. The Nolans were a girl group from the 1970s, I think they were. They had like a one hit wonder. I don't even know what it was. It was like I was a baby or something at the time. We're talking half a century ago. And um, they became cunts. They were very famous, although they kept trying to cover it up, deleting stories, whatever, of fucking anyone and everyone they could to get to be famous. And, oh, I might have heard of your name. We'll all fuck you together. And it got to the point where, at this stage of the game, she's about 40. I think she's in her late 30s, 40 or something. She looks a lot older. 
Um, uh, yeah, they went through life. They kept doing this and the other, presenting programs on TV. You know, the man hating lesbian show, loose women or whatever. And um, it came to a big head. This really vindictive, nasty streak in these Irish fucking. And um, of course, there is the whole thing about their granddad and their dad being there first. But they did Big Brother, or one of them did Big Brother. I'm not sure which one it was, you all look the fucking same. But Jim Davison, a guy who I used to like, but then found out that he's actually not an IRA funded Muslim. Different story. Um, and he basically, she kept coming out of all these nasty, snidey comments implying that he's a rapist. Oh, we know what he used to do to the girls. And. He was actually being a gentleman about it by not saying. He'd just been cleared by Operation New Tree of historic sex offences because he apparently done nothing wrong. And, um, yeah, basically, everyone became aware that she used to suck and fuck anything with a pulse. And she's trying to make him out for being a rapist when she was actually worse. So, um, yeah, it kind of fucked her career. Still, she'll still get gigs on Loose Women because she's a man-hating lesbian or whatever the fuck she wants to call herself these days. Like Erika Kaka Johnson. She destroys people's lives by branding them uh, rapists even though they're innocent. She still gets to work. Sucks to live in an anti-white man world. The, I think it's a Christmas special, Eurovision special. For the end of series 10, is really creepy to watch because it's got Terry Wogan. Terry Wogan is now dead. He died a couple of years ago. Pretty much all of his history has been deleted as an ongoing thing. People pay millions. They're still paying millions every year to keep his history buried. I'll give you a very brief synopsis. For about 60 years, he hosted between five, a minimum of five, and sometimes 50 beauty pageants for teenage girls and preteen girls. These were televised. And the fact that you cannot find any of these several thousand beauty pageants anywhere online shows just how dodgy they are. There's one thing that sticks in my head because I was a kid at the time. I think I was probably about 16, 17, and it was on TV. And it was actually in, I think it was Minehead, Butlins or Pontins or something like that. It was a teen beauty pageant. And he walks up to this one girl. Now, I remember it because she was my neighbour. She was 13. She's wearing a bikini, very skimpy bikini, back in the 1980s. And he stares at her tits with a nipple popping out. And says, whoa, they grow them big down here, don't they? Creepy Irish paedophile. There is a lot of shit about him online, a lot of videos about him online. You cannot get it by going through Google because it's so heavily censored. However, Google does not rule the world. You can find videos of him actually molesting children on the app during these beauty pageants and it is fucking disturbing to think about, let alone to actually watch. I have been compiling a list of stuff and clips of him doing this stuff, but I'm just going to get caught with these clips from Terry Wogan and get Although, arrested. Although, he's Irish to be sure in the left, even though he's born in England. He's Irish to be sure in the left, even though he's Gives me the fucking shits. Um, the guy on the left, Good I think when you're a vision, Joe Rogan, Logan, I can't fucking know. One hit wonder. Johnny Logan, possibly? Um, he's getting really pissed off because he's not being given points for nothing. And he's, he had a one hit wonder, I think. I don't know what it was. And he keeps threatening to attack Mark Lamar. Do you want to sit on that chair or wear it? And Mark Lamar is brilliant for dealing with these people. He goes, right then, stands up, picks a chair up and wears it like a, like a shoulder pad. And uh, trying to defuse the situation. And Logan's, he's taking his fucking jacket off. He's, I'm going to fuck it. Looks like my muscles. He hasn't got muscles. He's got arms. He doesn't actually have any muscle definition though. Yeah, it's creepy fuck. It's these people. Oh, my Irish are going to be scared of me. Fuck off. Creepy fucking bastards. Really famous for fucking kids as well, which really fucks me off. Ah, but they're going to learn sometime. Keeping the bloodline pure. I've got to start them off young. 
Yeah, creepy fuckers. Series 11, 2002, they've replaced Paddy with Bill Bailey. And he's brilliant. It's not just a fact that I like the guy because he does good comedy. And um, he's also a Russell. He's from the West Country. And he's brilliant. Um, 2002. I'm only nine minutes in. Year I'm only after he first started he making comments make humor about and jokes Jimmy Salabino without having to insult people. He was never out of the sex time. He doesn't have to be abusive publicly until after make he comedy. was dead. It's great. There's nothing ever reported about him being a paedophile or a rapist until after he was dead. And yet this is 2002, what, 10, 15 years before he died. Oh, this is the rose named after Jimmy Savile, which is actually true. Uh, you can tell it's his because he likes little buds. Little buds as in reference to budding boobs. Yeah, creepy. What's creepiest is the fact that apparently everyone knew in the industry what he was doing but no one said anything about it uh fear cash payoffs yeah which is more important getting your hands filled with cash or children being raped <laughs> 